Kyle, we are rapid fire drafting an NBA team. You get first pick. Giannis. All right. I'm going to go with Nikola and Luca. Okay. I get two picks. I'm going to go Steph Curry and Kevin Durant. I am going to go Jason Tatum and I am going to go with Joel. What a homer. Uh, I will go LeBron James and Devin Booker. You know what? Screw it. I'm going with Chris Paul. Interesting. I thought you might go John Morant there. That's an interesting choice. I like Chris Paul, though. That is a good move on your part. I need someone to get the ball in my playmaker's hands. Okay, Slump Busters, let us know which starting five of these NBA teams would you take in a best of seven matchup. Without further ado, it is time for your random sports fact of the week. Wow. Did you know that? Now live on the Slump Buster Podcast, random sports fact of the week. This week, for the first time, Duke and UNC will play in an NCAA tournament game. How historic is this rivalry? Duke and North Carolina have played a total of 256 times. Their first meeting came on January 24th, 1920. North Carolina leads the all-time series 142 to 115. In the 2021-2022 season, the teams are split. On March 5th, UNC got the 94 to 81 victory. Another caveat to this game is it is Coach K's last in this rivalry. In March of 1980, Mike Krzyzewski was named the head coach of Duke. Krzyzewski has a 50 and 47 career record against the Tar Heels. Both his 500th and 600th career win came against North Carolina. Regardless of Saturday's result, he will finish with a winning record against UNC. The Slump Buster Podcast. The Slump Buster Podcast. The first quarter starts now. The Brooklyn Nets are one of the most polarizing teams in the NBA this season. Every major sports book in Vegas has them as the second best odds to win the title behind Phoenix. Entering the year, they were the undisputed favorite. This was, of course, when James Harden was still on the roster. Harden is gone and Ben Simmons is in the building, kinda. My co-host Kyle Ledbetter is in lockstep with Vegas on this one as he has the Brooklyn Nets as his number four team in his power rankings, just behind Phoenix, the Bucks, and Philly. This comes a week after New York Mayor Eric Adams lifted the city's COVID mandate to allow Kyrie Irving to finally become a full-time participant again. Mr. Ledbetter, you never removed the Nets from your rankings top 10 all season, despite a bit of a below average record, multiple injuries, and players MIA for various reasons. Why are you so unwavering in your love of the Brooklyn Nets? Well, possibly many reasons I could be there. No, I'm just kidding. There's one reason. It's two words. Kevin Durant is the only reason that I am so high on the Brooklyn Nets. Why? Because just by having Kevin Durant on your team, you are a championship contender. You expect to win a championship as long as Kevin Durant plays on your basketball team. And you know what? Those are actually reasonable expectations. We have learned over the past 10 to 20 to even 30 years, if you want to go back to the Michael Jordan era, but more specifically the last like 15 to 20 years of professional basketball is that having a generational superstar in their prime on your team means that you expect to compete for a championship every single year. And that's somehow become a reasonable expectation. We can talk about Shaq and Kobe, who are the two generational players at the same time on the Lakers, which leads into an era of the Spurs and Tim Duncan, who was his generation's great player, which leads into eight consecutive years of LeBron James, which then leads into the Warriors getting like their two, the two best players of their generation. Now, Kevin Durant is better than Stephen Curry. Both of them are still generationally great. It's not to diminish the greatness of Stephen Curry. They're both generationally amazing. So question. So I saw that you moved the Nets from seven to four. Is this strictly based around the COVID mandates in New York being lifted? I'd say market correction. So Brooklyn kept going lower because Brooklyn kept losing games, right? So Brooklyn had like that 10 game losing streak in there when Kevin Durant was hurt and they were about to trade James Harden, all of the craziness that happened there. And I think that seven was a little harsh to Brooklyn because I think like Miami was ahead of them and Philadelphia was ahead of them at some points. And is it harsh to have the ninth ranked team in the Eastern Conference as a number seven team? in a power ranking? 
Uh, as long as they have Kevin Durant, right? So I subscribe to the theory that the NBA regular season, or at least seeding in the NBA regular season, but is they've almost had Kevin irrelevant. Durant. Yeah, and, and Brooklyn's gotten better as a result of that. But Brooklyn also have is they? loaded ever so slightly. They're not in jeopardy of missing the playoffs, but they are in that eight to nine range just because of what happened during those two months where they were losing every single game because Harden got traded, Kyrie was a part-time player, and Kevin Durant was out for two months. Their roster is built entirely on those three stars. And so if you take all three of them away for extended periods of time, of course, you're going to lose if Blake Griffin is your leading scorer. And so that's the reason why they have the seed they are now. I subscribe to the theory that as long as you get into the playoffs, the NBA regular season is almost irrelevant. Like as long as you just get in, you're going to be okay as long as you have Kevin Durant, as long as you have Giannis Antetokounmpo, it doesn't matter what seed you have. As long as you're there, you you at least have a puncher's chance. It'd be nice to have home court advantage, but relative to resting players, clearly the resting players part and making sure everyone's healthy for the playoffs supersedes whatever seed you're going to get in the playoffs. Let me give you some sports trivia. Who is the lowest seeded NBA team to ever win a title? I believe that is the 1995 Houston Rockets. Ding, ding, ding. And guess what seed they were? They were either a five or a six. A six. So in the history, in the 75-year history of the NBA, the lowest seeded team to win an NBA title was those Houston Rockets. And I believe that was also their repeat championship. So it's not like they didn't have a track record of already winning titles. The Brooklyn Nets, again, are currently an eight seed and can waver to being the ninth seed if they drop another game or two to a rest of the season schedule that is conducive to dropping a game or two. I think you sleep on the fact that the Brooklyn Nets have not been good against other good teams. You want to know their record against winning teams this year? 19 and 27. One of their records against the top four seeds in the Eastern Conference? They're one and three against the Celtics. They're one and three against the Heat. They're one and two against Milwaukee. And they are currently... Well, they're three and one against Philadelphia. We'll we'll mark that as the aberration here. In the last game, they just balled up and (laughs) after Philly fans for sure. But that's not good. That is not a good thing in a seven game series. If you're telling me that you're winning against good teams at a 40% clip, what's 40% of a seven game series? Two games? Three games, not enough to move on to the next round. So I don't have faith in them in a seven game series just based off their averages and not even playing to their averages. They need to play above their averages to move to the next round. They could always play below. And you know, the real danger is of being in this eight C, nine C territory, even though New York has decided to move on from these draconian COVID policies. Guess what? Toronto disagrees. And there is a good chance that the Brooklyn Nets end up having to go to our neighbors in the great white North. And if that is the case, then guess what? It's going to be Kevin Durant playing solo show once again against that Raptors team. Well, I know we dismiss, but they're a pretty good team. They're a well-rounded basketball team. So let's say first and foremost, it is never ideal to be in a one game winner go home situation. They may survive. It's not ideal to play in a one game winner go home situation because it's so random. Like one game in the NBA can be incredibly random. Now to the point I was going to go for before that, I could throw out that like the last LeBron team was a four seed or the heat were a five seed when they made the finals or the Bucks were a three seed last year and all kinds of stuff like that but what if all of those stats didn't matter I'm not saying they don't, but what if everything, but what if it doesn't matter in this example? What if Kevin Durant is the exception that proves the rule? So you are saying that Kevin Durant is so exceptional that he's better than players like LeBron James, that he's better than players like Michael Jordan, that he's better than players like Larry Bird, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He is the exceptional player that is going to break an unfortunate trend. I'm saying he's better than Fred Van Fleet, and I'm saying he's better than Evan Mobley. Well, I'm that's not... fine, but is he going to be better than Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, and Kyle Lowry when it comes to playoff time? Is he going to be better uh... than Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and the number one ranked Boston South? Celtics defense is he going to be better than Milwaukee last year's champion who did beat them and I know we talk about the one foot on the line thing to death but the bottom line is they got the win and Giannis and the team around him have only gotten better and we'll have that debate in the MVP discussion too but Giannis has gotten better this season so it's not even a one-to-one of just comparing them to last year's Milwaukee Bucks team yes and it's not a will they it's a they can't it's not they will it's a they can 
they can definitely single-handedly by having Kevin Durant beat the Miami Heat with whoever you want to put on the Miami Heat team, which is really deep, by the way. Like Miami is one of these legitimate contenders and they can single-handedly beat Boston and they can single-handedly with just Kevin Durant beat the Milwaukee Bucks because they almost did it last year and they would have a healthy Kyrie Irving theoretically in this playoff series. It's not a guarantee. You can tell me who's healthy and who's not healthy and I reserve the right to change my opinions on this, but they can. They can do it. It's not a guarantee that they will because all of this is just probabilities and, and possibilities, but the Clippers cannot. The Clippers are the eight seed in the West. The Clippers cannot. The Minnesota Timberwolves cannot. Uh, who else are we is saying the cannot so, win a championship? Is that what you're asking? Yes. So they cannot go into Miami and, and beat the Miami Heat in a seven. Well, that would series. be very hard for them to do, considering they're in the Western Conference. Yeah. Well, throw out an Eastern Conference example: the the Knicks, the the Hornets. Those teams can't, without significant injury, changing the series. Like both teams, as we think they're going to be constructed in the playoffs, the Hornets cannot go into Milwaukee and win a seven game series against the Bucks. The the Cavs cannot go into Milwaukee and win a seven game series but against. You know the Bucks. what? I will tell you the Hornets can do they can beat the Brooklyn Nets in one game yes they can do that it is highly unlikely it would just be a catastrophically disappointing and it just happened it just yeah. happened like last week and you know mm-hmm. what you talk about this Brooklyn Nets team like they have these two superstars and they can just run through the east Kyrie Irving they've had Kyrie Irving now you know part-time player but they've had him they're nine and 13 when Kyrie Irving's in the starting lineup Yes, I do. I do not disagree with you at all on that situation. A one game sample size is incredibly random and Brooklyn does not want to play. I didn't just say a one game sample size. I just gave you a 22 game sample size. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, one game, one game in the playoffs for your season. Brooklyn can lose that one game is random and Brooklyn does not want to play that one game. At the same time, they don't really have a choice because of like all the things you were talking about. Ben Simmons not being there. Kyrie Irving, you know, being a part-time player who's now going to be a full-time player while also load managing the next two weeks. Kevin Durant being at whatever strength he is. Those are things that in a one game sample size can lead to to them losing. Now, they really want to be the eighth seed because if they get to be the eighth seed, that means that Brooklyn gets two games and they just can't lose both. They get two chances to win one game. If they're the nine seed, they have to win back-to-back games without um, losing once. They have to go 2-0. and If they're the eight seed, they just have to not go 0-2. So right now they're about one game ahead of the Charlotte Hornets. They're two and a half behind the Cavs. They're one ahead of the Charlotte Hornets. So if they get the eight seed, I would exhale if I'm Brooklyn. You just have to beat Cleveland. You just have to beat Cleveland one game. And even if you mess up in some weird, like, I don't know, Evan Mobley drops 40 points or something we or Kevin Durant has a really, really terrible game that we've never seen from Kevin Durant before. You at least get a second chance against Trey Young. Completely likely, though, completely possible. In fact, a good probability because this Nets defense is atrocious. They are the 22nd ranked defense in the NBA. And then you look at some of the other contenders. We have three top 10 defenses between Boston, Philadelphia, and Miami. Last night, they gave up 34 to Cade Cunningham. They took forever to put down a 19 win or 20 win Pistons team that is all things that as who the Brooklyn Nets are at a certain point you just are what you are it's like you are what you eat how you play how you play in the regular season is indicative of how the Nets will perform this postseason spell it out with me the Brooklyn Nets are f-r-a-u-d-s frauds and I am I saying very it much disagree right now very much disagree with that I think you could make the argument the Brooklyn Nets are the greatest eight seed to ever enter the NBA playoffs and that is again nothing to do with what happened in the regular season only to do with the fact that they still have a healthy Kevin Durant going into you the playoffs are basing this entire argument on that they have a second switch they're just going to turn on the light switch the second the playoffs start and I don't think that they have that in them I don't think that they're going to become twice the players that they are now because they're already doing good things 
They put up 70 points against Memphis just a couple days ago and still lost. Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant put up 70 points combined earlier this week and still lost. Is Blake Griffin going to turn on a second gear? Is Seth Curry going to turn on a second gear? Drummond? Any of these secondary pieces have to step up because it can't just be Kevin Durant. It can't just be Kyrie Irving. And from experience, aside from one shot, one shot that has defined Kyrie Irving's whole career, is he really that much of a playoff legend? Is is that really who Kyrie Irving is? I I know we've had this debate. I, I know maybe even a personal bias here. I'm not a big Kyrie fan, but I don't have that same level of faith and conviction that he's going to be the co-pilot behind Kevin Durant and he's just going to go from being this part-time player to now finally being a full-time participant again and elevate this team to where they aspire to be. I think everyone wants to diminish how great Kyrie Irving is and I'm not going to be the person for whatever the reasons may be. There's a lot of reasons to dislike Kyrie Irving and Celtics fans are in a compromised position because they dislike Kyrie Irving for different reasons than the rest of the world dislikes Kyrie Irving because he personally dismantled their franchise for two years just by leaving and saying he was going to stay and all of that. But Kyrie Irving is a very good basketball player and very good basketball players are something that the Toronto Raptors, Cleveland Cavaliers, and then uh, Charlotte Hornets have maybe one of. Between the three teams, they have maybe one very good basketball player. And that's kind of the, the gist of it, right? If Kyrie Irving's your best player, you can kind of look like an eight seed in the East at times. And if he's your second best player and that best player is Kevin Durant, you can still be at the I, top. I'm going to disagree with that math a little bit this season. I think this season has shown that team basketball still has its place in the NBA because you started the season, we all started the season saying, Saying, hey, look at the Los Angeles Lakers. They have three really good players. They have three superstars. And what does that mean for their season? I don't know. What are they, 13 games under 500 at this point? Could put. But let's see how team basketball works for Cleveland when they face the Bucs in the first round. They are going to get smacked out of the playoffs. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. Cleveland was this year like projected to be the 12th team in the Eastern Conference. That's still really good. You did a great job that you didn't have to have the expectations of we're going to win a championship right now. That's but, really, really good. But my thing here, Kyle, is we have enough data to not just rely on just the names. It sounds like we're relying on just the names. They have Kevin Durant. They have Kyrie Irving. They also have, again, a sub 500 record against winning team. That is all part of what the Brooklyn Nets are. And I don't think it's just suddenly going to change just because the calendar flips from April to May. But what if that didn't matter? What if all of that didn't matter? And all that matters is... It does matter. But we don't it, know if it did it, if it didn't matter, then they wouldn't be with one of the lowest seeds of any title contender that we're throwing around loosely title contender in the NBA. And we're all by the way, we're also not that far off on it. I'm not saying that I think Brooklyn's going to win the championship. I don't think Brooklyn is going to win the championship. I think that Brooklyn is still the somewhere between the second and fourth best team in the Eastern Conference. That doesn't mean they're going to win a championship. It just means their seed doesn't reflect reflect how good or bad the the Brooklyn Nets actually are. And this is the interesting part about this is there are a lot of really good teams this year. And each team has their flaws to a certain extent. Milwaukee's flaws are slightly less flawed than everyone else's, but Milwaukee is like one and then two, three, four, but it's not like Milwaukee's like exponentially ahead of everyone else. Like everyone is really good this year. I know we've done many Boston debates here on this show, but Boston is still a very good team. Do I think that they stack up against the Nets in the first round? I think Brooklyn would be favored, but if Boston beat Brooklyn, I'd be like, well, that's surprising, but probably explainable. If Miami beat Brooklyn, I'd be like, well, that would surprise me, but it would be explainable. Here's if- the problem. It should not be surprising. It really shouldn't be because we have data that supports it not being a surprising thing. The Nets have played as many games as these other teams have played. And even if you take out just the one month hiatus of Kevin Durant, they've still been a pretty mediocre team. Kevin Durant has gotten to this interesting place where we take a lot of his abilities for granted. It's and not so even about his abilities, Kyle. It's just about the team. We're talking about the Brooklyn Nets as the team right now. Yeah, and that's okay. And the team revolves around this one giant piece that is just by virtue of him being on a team, automatically one of the five best teams in the NBA. Now that might not be the case two years from now. Like Kevin Durant will age at some point. It's the same way we're watching LeBron age. 
age, the same way we're watching Steph Curry age. I was actually coming back from his Achilles injury. I kind of put Kevin Durant in the the like where Kawhi Leonard box is right now, where I'm like, I just have no idea what he's going to be when he gets back. And I saw Kevin Durant average 37 points per game in a series against the Milwaukee Bucks, in which he single-handedly carried the Brooklyn Nets to seven games and coming within a foot two size. And I know we mentioned the foot all the time with Kevin Durant, but I'd also like to bring up the fact he had a 49-point triple-double in game five, and he had a 50-point triple-double in that game seven where they went to overtime. Like, this guy is absolutely levels above the competition other than maybe three or four players in the NBA. There are three or four players that stack up to this man, and those three or four players are going to lead teams that beat him in the playoffs. Again, Kevin Durant is good. Kevin Durant is great. Kevin Durant is phenomenal. When Kevin Durant is retired, he will probably be a top 10 player of all time. But I am (laughs) focusing on the 2022 version of Kevin Durant, the 2022 version of the Brooklyn Nets. And what I've seen from them to this point tells me that they are not one of the top five teams in the NBA. They might not even be one of the top five teams in the Eastern Conference. I'll use the caveat, Mike, but here today, if I'm making my playoff picks and I'm telling you who's going to go to the championship, what I won't tell you is going to be the winner. But what I will tell you is it won't be the Brooklyn Nets. The Brooklyn Nets, I will say, will go no further than the second round in the Eastern Conference. Spicy, full, no mercy. Cajones pick of the week. I will say that that might be a semantics argument because they're going to have to play. No very... semantics. Second round oh. of the NBA Eastern Conference. Well, so here's the part that I'd argue. So like, let's say the Bucks and 76ers are the one and two seed. We don't know what the one and two seed is going to be, but let's say that they're the, the one and two seed. And Brooklyn is the, I don't know, let's say seven seed. Let's say they end up in the seven seed just for, for shits and gigs. The one seed, say one seed is Milwaukee. Well, Milwaukee's going to get to play, say, Atlanta in the first round. Well, that's a that's a cakewalk of a series for Milwaukee. Milwaukee's going to win that in either four or five games. Philadelphia would have to play Brooklyn in the first round. And that's a really difficult matchup because Brooklyn might be favored against the Philadelphia 76ers going into that series. And I will give you, of course, that I mentioned it earlier, but... Brooklyn does have a three and one record against Philadelphia styles do make fights. And that might be one of the fights in which the nets might have a puncher's chance as you referred to earlier. Well, yeah. And I think we could flip that around too. So like say Milwaukee's the two seed and Brooklyn's the seven seed that should be in the conference finals. Like those Kevin Durant versus Giannis is like a conference finals level matchup. So yeah, Brooklyn might lose in the first round, but that's just because they had to play who they played in the first round. And I don't think that they should be criticized for just playing who they play. They just, that's how the matchups worked out for them. I'm just saying, if you're one of those teams up top, if you're one of the top teams in the Eastern conference, I don't think that you necessarily have to gear your postseason or gear your final eight regular season games with the idea of, oh, we got to avoid the net. I I think that they are a beatable team. I, I don't think I would worry about them. And if I'm a good team, track record shows that I have a good chance of beating them. I have a better than 500 chance of beating them. I just need to play to my abilities. That's going to be the big question, of course, to all these teams. Can you just play to your abilities? I'm even asking you to play to the best versions of yourself. Just play to your abilities because Boston has an outstanding defense. Miami runs guys off the bench and are one of the deeper lineups. And Milwaukee has perhaps the greatest player in the NBA currently. Yes. And that's why I would put Milwaukee definitely over Brooklyn because Brooklyn does have their flaws. Like let's not pretend Brooklyn doesn't have flaws with their team. Their flaws are more pronounced than the Milwaukee Bucks flaws, which are, well, I mean, Drew Holiday might miss some three pointers. That's not as terrible as they don't play defense. Like that's more of a flaw, but they can, but Brooklyn can overcompensate for that. Brooklyn can overcompensate for not being able to play defense with Kevin. You can do it against bad teams. I don't think you could do it consistently against good teams. It's interesting, right? This is why we play the series, because you're in this weird place where in a seven game series, you can design yourself specifically for a matchup and make adjustments. And that might mean your defense plays a little bit better because you've seen the same opponent over and over and over again, and you can create a different game plan around it. You cannot game plan Kevin Durant because Kevin Durant is seven foot one and maybe the greatest shooter in the history of the NBA. You can 
hand in his face as much as you'd like. That man, not shooter, scorer, but also really good shooter. But still, Kevin Durant yeah, is one of the best. He's part of the Splash Bros, but he's not He's not. Steph he's Curry. a scorer. I should have said scorer more than shooter. One of the, the greatest offensive player of my lifetime. We'll call it that. But he's the greatest offensive player of my life. Milwaukee is much better constructed than Brooklyn. Philadelphia is as well constructed as Brooklyn. Miami and Boston, I think think would probably fall to Brooklyn in a series like we talked about earlier. And it's really difficult. Those two teams are also pretty good. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm I'm thinking back to the other power rankings and like the Nets are four and then Miami is like seven and Boston is eight. And that's kind of it. Like they're further, they're, they're behind Brooklyn. It looks like they're a tier behind Brooklyn, but at the same time, Brooklyn could be either one of those options, right? Like their team is so predicated on Kevin Durant that if Kevin Durant does play poorly, which again, never happens. Kevin Durant never, ever plays like has a terrible like LeBron 17 point game in a playoff series. Like I'm it, sure we could find one if we really wanted to do the research here. We could find one game log that you're like, uh. That's kind of gross. But he's played like 80 playoff games over the last four seasons, and you'd struggle to find one or two where he's not scoring 25 points per game. You can find them somewhere in the archives, but it rarely ever happens for Kevin Durant. And that is the point that like, if you're banking on the 3% chance that Kevin Durant has an awful game multiple times in a series, then yes, that changes Brooklyn. Brooklyn is incredibly Kevin Durant centric. And I would argue you should make that bet. Not with the value that you're getting right now. They're not the favorites to win the Eastern Conference. Vegas just wants you to bet Brooklyn. That's why they're juicing the value so much on Brooklyn. They want you to bet because they know Brooklyn is not going to win the Eastern Conference. And I'd say your bet is that he can get you to the top four. He can get you to the top four just by virtue of being on that team. Kyle Ledbetter here today, staring into the camera, locking eyes. Do you bet me $10 that the Brooklyn Nets will make the Eastern Conference Finals? Yes, if you can guarantee me that they won't play Milwaukee in the first two rounds. If you can guarantee me they won't face Milwaukee in the first two rounds, then I would take that bet. I'd be nervous about the 76ers. As long as Milwaukee and Brooklyn don't face until the conference finals, then I would say yes. I will take the bet. But if if Milwaukee and Brooklyn meet in the first or second round, then I will say that's just semantics. But what I would be essentially betting $10 on is will Brooklyn beat Philadelphia in a playoff series? And oh, man, I don't know. I do not know if Brooklyn can beat Philadelphia in a playoff series. These guys are on fire. Let's hear more. Second quarter starts now. The phrase speed kills is one way to describe the 2022 Miami Dolphins. After signing running backs Chase Edmonds and Raheem Mostert in free agency, the Dolphins weren't done. They traded for the fastest player in the league, the Cheetah, Tyreek Hill. Joining us to talk the state of Miami, Dougley Do Wrong of the Dougley Do Wrong YouTube channel. Want to follow him? It's just Dougley Do Wrong on Twitter and Instagram. Dougley or Doug, what's been right about the offseason in South Beach? The aggression. Chris Greer came out and he said he was going to be aggressive. And at first, a lot of Dolphin fans, including myself, were very skeptical. I was like, a lot of what you were doing was not aggressive, Chris Greer. And then he got aggressive. So, and then the, filling in what the Dolphins want to do offensively, like you see what the 49ers did, you know, with Devo Samuel and their run style and all that stuff. And you and you start to see the translation of what Mike McDaniel's trying to install on this offense with, like you said, speed. Speed's going to kill. And a lot of opposing defenses are going to have to deal, especially when the Dolphins play home. And it's like 90 degree weather and you have these guys running all over the place by halftime that the other defenses can be gassed. So it's going to be interesting. In your most recent video, so you just dropped the video grading their free agency. You gave the Dolphins an A. Was that strictly the free agent moves? Did you throw in Tyree Kill into that decision there to give them that letter grade? And if not adding Tyree Kill, what exactly was the move that moved that from, let's say, a B or a lesser grade to an A? 
for you? So, yeah, I essentially, when I gave the free agency grade, it was kind of everything they did in that free agency period of the past two weeks. I consider the trade for Tyreek Hill a free agency move. Yeah, it would be an A plus if they addressed the linebacker core. To me, that is now the weakest part of the Miami Dolphins. It was the offensive line. It was like offensive line, wide receivers, linebackers, then running backs. So it was kind of like that. Now it's linebackers are up there. Bobby Wagner just signing with the Rams. Kind of was hoping he'd come to Miami. So yeah, it would be an A plus if they go out and get JC Treader or if they address the linebacking core. But the fact that those little pieces are still iffy, like are they still going to stick with Dieter? What are they doing at right tackle? And what are they doing at middle linebacker is why I didn't give them an A plus. But I think they killed it. You know, some of the unsung heroes like Alec Ingold, bringing him in is going to drastically help that run game. So I think you were very solid. They wanted to keep the defense the same. Again, there's this top 15 defense the past two years. So they wanted to keep it the same, keep the coaches in there, keep the players in there and just kind of fix the offense. So I think it was pretty solid, solid A. All right. Well, let's talk about the Tyreek Hill trade specifically because the Miami Dolphins get, you know, a 27 year old receiver who could retire tomorrow and you could make a case for him making the Hall of Fame. Obviously, they had to give up one hundred and twenty million dollars with about 72 of that guaranteed plus five draft picks, including a first round pick in this year's draft. So obviously it's a high price tag, especially for a position that most people don't regard as a a position that's a game changing type of player. So what do you make of the trade? Obviously Tyreek Hill makes the Dolphins the better team, but given what they gave up to get him, what did you make when the news came in last week? I was surprised, right? It was quick. It was quick uh, from our standpoint. It was like an hour, like I think around like 10 o'clock. It was like Adam Schefter was like a Tyreek Hill potential trade to the Jets or the Dolphins. And then like hour later, all of a sudden, boom, Dolphins trade everything seems like to get Tyreek Hill. Uh, But when you talk to Chris Greer, that was in the works since the Friday before. So it was in the works a day after free agency started. So again, I was sitting back saying, where's the aggression? We didn't know what was going on behind doors. I like the move. I think like, again, it fits, especially you're going to pair him with Waddle. And it's like, all right, who are you double covering? Who are you pressing? And then they bring in Cedric Wilson Jr., another speedy, you know, vertical threat wide receiver. It's like the Dolphins are making it easy for Tua to say, look, I'm not the bum that people call me, but I like the trade in the fact that it was only one first round pick. The Dolphins have two fourths this year. They gave up only one fourth. So it was a first, a second, a fourth, and a sixth this year. And then I think next year was just a fourth and a sixth. I'm fine with that, especially because we still have the two firsts next year. The cap hit. This year, it's only six million. And then next year is when he gets his 30. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But it's essentially like a four-year contract because after the fourth year, they have an out because he's due like 50 million in the fourth the fifth year and there's no way in god's green earth anyone's gonna pay a wide receiver 50 million dollars surprise quarterbacks get paid that much but his addition it helps it helps the team it helped like look at vegas our odds of winning the division shot up it helps a lot it was surprising i didn't expect it to be made i thought there was going to be more offensive line defensive help but i like the move a lot and i think he's gonna he's gonna be extremely dangerous and you could tell it was a good move because jet fans are like pissed and they're trying to like <laughs> down Paul oh, he's not gonna do anything anyway because two doesn't throw in blah, blah, blah. you can tell when somebody wants that player that they all of a sudden get real butthurt after they don't get them speaking about a New York based football franchise the Giants did something very similar with Daniel Jones last offseason they went out there they acquired him a big free agent target in Kenny Galladay they drafted a first round wide receiver the Miami Dolphins already have their first round wide receiver in Jalen Waddle and now they're going out and getting Tyreek Hill obviously improving the line improving the weapons gain an offensive minded head coach, all good things. But what type of pressure does that put on Tua this coming season? I think Tua, it's funny too, because a lot of people want to say like no more excuses. And the funny thing is Tua has, himself has never came out and given any excuses. It's always the fans. The fans want to raffle off a ton of excuses, which most of them are justified on um, Tua's struggle. Tua never does it. I think he's him consistently putting the pressure on himself to be better. It's hard to be successful in the team that he had last year, even the year before, because by the time he faced the Chiefs in his rookie year, he had none of his starting receivers healthy. Um, Last year, he had the worst. It's not even one of the worst. He had the worst offensive line. So a lot of people are are complaining. Why doesn't he push the ball down the field? Why doesn't he throw it down the field and all that stuff? Well, if you have no run game, 
and you have no time to throw the ball down the field, but all of a sudden the defense isn't going to respect your deep passes and they're going to press the box. They're going to blitz you. They're going to do all these things and nothing's going to open down the field. So I think adding the players that the Dolphins added, and it's a lot, like you said, Moster, Chase Edmonds, Tyreek Hill, Tron Armstead, Connor Williams, Alec Ingold. It's like, all right, here you go to it. This is what you needed. If everything on paper plays like it should, here you go. Here's everything you needed. Now show us the Alabama to it. Show us the guy who's going to throw the ball down the field, who's going to, because we've seen it. And my biggest thing with two is his inconsistency because we see it. We see it in games where he'll evade pressure, throw the ball down the field. That jet game where he ran over the friggin' uh, safety. Like we see him playing at a top level, but then the next play, he'll like throw an interception. And all of a sudden, everyone forgets about his nice plays. So once he can chain it together and stay more consistent, I think people are going to start realizing the type of quarterback he can be. Well, you mentioned consistency, and that's the thing that people talk about all the time when it comes to Rodgers or, or Tom Brady or even someone of the caliber of a Kyler Murray is like, mm. they consistently push the ball down the field, but they also don't make mistakes. So given what the Dolphins have done, and I guess given your opinions of Tua, do you think that they've done enough to potentially help Tua be more consistent as a quarterback? 100%. Yeah, like this is as close as you can get to a perfect offense for Tua to be successful. Like you brought up Aaron Rodgers. I think he the he threw an interception week one and then he didn't throw one for like the rest of the season. Like he's just super consistent when it comes to protecting the ball. This is as close as you can get to a perfect situation. This is what should have happened when Tua got drafted to the Dolphins. Because you saw that what happened to Joe Burrow. You saw that what happened with Justin Herbert. Okay, we're going to take this quarterback. Let's build around him. Let's give him the offense that he's used to, all that. They didn't do that for Tua. They didn't do that for like a whole year and a half. And then they thought bringing in three offensive coordinators is really going to help the kid. It just confused them. <laughs> so if this is the, the first time that Tua, somebody's actually sitting back and saying, let me help this kid out and let me put him in a situation that I can make him successful versus I'm going to make the defense successful and then just don't mess it up. That's essentially was Tua's first two years in the league. The defense is going to win you games. Don't mess it up. So he was like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to force it down the field. I'm not going to try to make errant passes, yada, yada. This is the closest that I've seen the Dolphins get to helping their quarterback. Even going back to Ryan Tannehill, a lot of people wanted to say Dolphins didn't help Ryan Tannehill. They tried and they just didn't do a good job of it. This seems to be the closest. This was a very busy offseason in the coaching hiring cycle. We saw a lot of turnover. And I think one of the biggest surprises, of course, was Brian Flores getting relieved of his duties in Miami. Flores had consecutive winning seasons, but obviously in the three years he was there, never made the playoffs. Would you have made the move? And what was your reaction when it first went down? I was surprised and not in the aspect that I didn't think he was going to get fired. But once they went eight of nine, no. Yeah. Eight of nine for the last nine games. I was like, all right, well, he just secured his job. Like there's no, because if I'm the owner, once he hit one and seven, I'm firing him. Like that's just the way I, I would have saw it. And it's not even him. Once they hit one and seven, I'm firing him angrier. Like I'm, I'm done. You guys had how many draft picks, how much cap space, and you had all of this resources to build a great team. And you're starting one and seven after going 10 and six. And you're taking that huge of a step back. I'm firing them both. Greer, you're gone. Flores, you're gone. We'll have an interim for now and then I'm going to get the best coach when the season's over that's what I'm doing and the coach comes in GM comes in they do whatever they need to I want to win now so I was surprised they kept him and then also he started winning and then I was like well he ain't going anywhere now they got fired and then we all know about the legal issues but I'm not I wasn't necessarily surprised he got fired because like I said you go 10 and 6 and then all of a sudden you get rid of a ton of vets Bobby McCain Kyle Van Noy Eric Flowers Ted Karras all of a sudden your offensive line is garbage because you have first and second year starters versus opposite of Jesse Davis four of them are first and second year starters like you think that's going to be successful and you have an offensive line coach who's been doing it never like this was his first offensive line coaching job and you honestly could sit back and say oh this offensive line is going to protect Tua Tagovailoa. Week two, broken ribs. It's like, and then it took him how many weeks to take Austin Jackson from left tackle to left guard? And he kept Jesse Davis, who broke Tua's ribs in all season at right tackle. So it, it's like, it was a pile up. That's why I'm saying like, if it was me, once you lost to the Bills, you went one and seven, you're out. I'll bring somebody else in because he just didn't make the moves on offense. He was so focused on defense. And that's the other thing, right? All of a sudden in that Bills game, you saw a different defense. You saw a more aggressive Dolphin defense. And then they started winning. 
And a lot of players, uh, Emmanuel Agba, Jerome Baker, Xavier Howard came out and said, oh, we went back to 2020 Miami Dolphin defense. So you went on a seven game losing streak and that's when you thought you should go back to your old defense. Those were my, would be my thought processes. Um, you got to go. So that's why you know, I was surprised because he won so many games towards the end of the season, but I wasn't because it took him too long to make the right decisions to change the team. Well, how do you feel about McDaniels now? Because I've been joking for the past three months, he was their plan C option as head coach. <laughs> so how do, you, how do you feel about him now that we've gotten into the off season? Yeah, there, there's there's all those rumors. You know, at first it was Dable and then Dable went to the Giants and then it was a hard push for um, Harbaugh. And then he decided, I'm going to go back to Michigan. They Apparently are we also know Sean Payton now too. Sean Payton yeah, was they, also they, they, requested was talk for with interview. That. So it, technically it was like the plan D option. And the Harbaugh thing too, there's a lot of speculation that if if Brian Flores didn't come out with the lawsuit that he was going to go with the Dolphins. But once that happened, he was like, I'm not going to deal with that. And he backed out. I like McDaniel. I think he's a, a player's coach and he's smart. I watched a lot of film breakdown where he is incredibly smart. He knows how to take half of your defense away with just simply putting one player on one side. He uses Kittle very well and motions and stuff. It's very smart. Now I've gotten high and mighty and very excited for coaches. I did it with Adam Gase and I did it with Brian Flores and it bit me in the butt. So I'm being cautiously optimistic but if he can do to the Dolphins offense what he did with the 49ers and if the defense can stay the way it has played the past two years I think this is going to be a really good team especially because a lot of his players are still talking to him Kittle and Debo Samuel and all those guys they love Mike McDaniel so he's the type of coach that I'm going to show you like I'm not going to yell at you and preach to you that you should do this I'm just going to give you an example like here go play here do what I tell you and then let's see how it pans out oh you just got an interception see listen to me I'm going to help you out. So I'm excited, but again, I'm cautiously optimistic. Doug, I tell you this, if the Dolphins trade for Debo Samuel, we're scrapping, we're fighting, my friend. I, you know, I don't see McDaniel deviating too much from the offense he ran in San Francisco. I, I see him sticking to it. He was one of the longest tenured Shanahan assistants. So clearly it's an offense that he knows how to run inside and out. And that brings up questions with Tua versus Jimmy G. How does he utilize the quarterback position? And I don't think it would be a bad thing if Tua became essentially the left-handed Jimmy Garoppolo. Because for all the flack that Jimmy gets, wins more games than he loses, mm -hmm. doesn't make the wow throw, but makes enough good throws throughout the course of a game to help you win those games. If Tua becomes nothing more than, like I mentioned, left-handed Jimmy G, are you okay with that? Or do you think it's a disappointment given he was a top five drafted quarterback? I'd like a little bit more than Jimmy G. No offense to Jimmy G. I feel like he's the reason you guys aren't in the Super Bowl last year. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I honestly think if, if you had a different quarterback than Jimmy G, I think you guys would have won the Super Bowl last year. He held you guys back. There's a lot of dumb throws by him that Tua won't make. Tua, he's accurate. And he's a little bit more mobile than Jimmy G. Uh, and he's young. And that was my biggest talking point when I was watching the playoffs last year. And again, I'm sorry. I'm like ripping on your team. But I said, hey, if Jimmy G can get this far, we can get far with Tua. Like, come on. Like, and, and a lot of people don't like Tua push back and said, Jimmy G's better and this and that. Um, <laughs> one, but, one thing I'll say here, it, it, those guys, those Shanahan, those mm -hmm. LaFleurs, McDaniel, they value the system more than the yes. quarterback. Yes. And that's the thing I appreciate and I'm excited to see because it's not going to be a, a fight with your quarterback situation. And also, I don't know if this is an upcoming question, but I don't see if Tua doesn't pan out because again, you guys asked, is this the perfect situation? And it is, it doesn't pan out. I'm not surprised if Mike McDaniel moves on from Tua after one year because they have the two first round picks next year. I honestly think the reason they are putting all of this stuff around Tua is for two reasons. One, let's see what you got because you got everything now. And if not, it's super enticing for another quarterback to see, oh, you got all these weapons in this offensive line. I want to go to Miami now versus if it was this year, everyone's like, I don't know, Miami, they suck. So it's going to be interesting. But if he is the left arm to Jimmy G, I'm not that upset. Jimmy G went to the Super Bowl. Like, are you kidding me? I, I, he's, a, he's a solid quarterback. People forget. Everyone wants the Justin Herbert never been to a playoff game. They want, like, all of these high throwing, you know, legit quarterbacks, but forget about the Trent Dilfer, the Rich Gannons, the, all these guys who've won the Super Bowl or been to the Super Bowl. And it is possible. You just have to have the right team. Like Tom Brady wasn't that great his first few years. It wasn't until like what year three, four, that all of a sudden you got the actual Tom Brady. So I wouldn't be upset with the left hand of Jimmy G. Yeah. This is the interesting part is like, everyone wants the quarterback, but what do you do if you don't have the guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like you gotta, you gotta kind of improvise there. And two is not 
terrible. He's just not great either. So you kind of find your middle ground there. So the disagreement that Juju and I have is that he believes in the McDaniel system. He believes in his 49ers buddy. And he thinks that the the Dolphins may have a, a top 10 rushing game next season. And I say that their running back room, regardless of the people they added, is still terrible. Because even if you add Edmonds and Mostert, Miles Gaskin is still technically the number one. And I don't think that any system or improved offensive line is going to change them from one of the worst rushing games to, to top 10 without getting a better running back. So how do you feel about the Dolphins running game going into next year? Um, I got to see it. I got to see it on the field and I got to see it in camp and stuff. But I see where you're coming from because especially last year, a, a lot of what I saw was like Duke Johnson was breaking off big runs and then they would take him off the field. Some of it had to do with the offensive line, but then some of it had to do with the running backs. Because again, you'd have Miles Gaskin, you have Savan Ahmed, you'd have all these guys who were just struggling to have nice games. Then you plug in Duke Johnson, all of a sudden in his second game, he, he's busting off a hundred yard game. So it's a yin and yang situation with the offensive line. But I think going back to that traditional style of running and bringing in the Alec in gold and then the style and the semantics and all that stuff that Mike McDaniel can do with the offense when it comes to motions, when it comes to opening up lanes, taking away the defense. I'm very excited because Connor Williams talked about it with the zone runs scheme and how it takes the defense off their feet because it, it moves them. It moves the entire defense and it helps the offensive line be able to push these guys over. And if they can take Teron Armstead and do what they did with Williams, where they motioned him, that's like a wrecking ball. Like when I watched them first do that in the playoffs, I was like, is this like the first time I really watched Should be illegal. football? Should be illegal. Phil's illegal. It was terrifying. If I, I used to play defensive end, I would, I would be scared to see him coming at me like that. Like, are you kidding me? I think they'll prosper. And I think, cause you're going to see Tyreek Hill back there. You're probably see Jalen Waddle back there. It's not going to be like, we're not going to have a thousand yard rusher. I don't think we're going to do that, but I think the team in a whole, I think it's going to be successful. And I think it's going to be a run first. You might even see Alec Ingold get like five, 600 rushing yards. So we'll see. Again, I'm cautiously optimistic. I, I have a saying on my channel. I'd rather be surprised than let down because there's too many times after the 2016 season, the 20, 2008 season where I'm like, yeah. And then, and I did it last. I did this past season. I'm like 10 and six. You can only go up from here. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're Finns fam or to a non, definitely Doug. You have a channel that people should be following. Tell people about all your work. Where can they find you besides YouTube? What type of stuff are you working on, man? Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so I'm, if I'm not on YouTube, I'm on Twitter a lot. But a lot of what I, it's year round. Like I don't take a break. So like I just, the free agency is kind of, dying down right now for Friday's the first so I'm going to start going into the draft even though the Dolphins don't pick until the third round so I'm still gonna live stream it but it's gonna be real boring for me and my Dolphin fans but I break down all time um, my top five prospects at each position and then when training camp comes I give you know play by play for training camp OTAs all that stuff and then I live stream every game I do a pre post game all that cool stuff so I got a lot going on over there Dougley do wrong do right and hit that subscribe button on this guy's channel the Slump Buster guys are killing it. Half done. Third quarter is beginning now. Normally, my co-host hates the NBA MVP debate. But with a mere two weeks of games to go, we can start talking in resolutes and casting our votes appropriately. Vegas has the latest MVP voting odds listed as such. Joel Embiid is the favorite at minus 200, running away from Nikola Jokic at plus 150. Giannis Antetokounmpo plus 800. And then the distant dark horses in the top five, Devin Booker at plus 2,500. Then you have Luka and Ja tied respectively at five with plus 5,000. Meanwhile, ESPN did their own internal poll of 100 members of the media, and the Joker was selected to repeat. Kyle, after hearing what Vegas and ESPN think, what do you think? Well, as someone who stands a little bit for Giannis Antetokounmpo every now and then, I'd like to point out that currently right now, Giannis Antetokounmpo has a higher player efficiency rating than Joel Embiid. It's not by much. It's a 32.4 compared to the 31 for Joel Embiid. But I understand that we're tired of giving Giannis MVP considerations. We all know he's the best player in the world. Getting and that old LeBron James treatment, huh? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, he's still going to finish in the top two or top three or whatever he ends up getting. But, you know, we're just a little 
little tired of giving it to Giannis. I will remember this historically the same way I remember that James Harden finished in the top two of MVP voting four times in five years because James Harden was that dude for a long time. He is amazing at basketball. So Giannis is probably not going to get it, but I'd argue that it's a toss up between Jokic and Giannis. That would be my pick there. I think Jokic being in like the five seed is the thing that people are holding against him. That team is basically the 2018 Orlando Magic outside of Nikola Jokic. And he's doing his best, man. He hasn't had Murray the whole season. He hasn't had Porter the whole season. I argued that he should try and force a trade to the Phoenix Suns this week. He is in a really rough situation. And also, he's been the NBA MVP this year, putting up 26 points, about 12 rebounds, close to a triple-double average. And Nikola Jokic also has the highest player efficiency rating of any player in the NBA over the past three seasons. This might be one of the most efficient and best, most productive seasons in the NBA. And for people who maybe don't tune in every now and then, player efficiency rating is the statistic that most reflects the eye test in the NBA. 17 of the last 20 NBA MVPs have led the league in player efficiency rating. There is no perfect step, but player efficiency rating is a good one for determining the eye test of who is the best player in the league. What you did mention, this is a very compelling MVP race because a lot of these guys, or specifically Embiid, Jokic, and Giannis, are all fairly close in those player efficiency stats. They're very close in a lot of statistics, and I can make compelling cases for all three of them off various statistics. When I think about Embiid, Embiid was my favorite for the majority of the year, and maybe I'm starting to waver a little bit as I start to kind of like do a little bit more research into recent MVPs and how the committee has voted on their MVP decisions, how the media has voted on their MVP decisions. For Joel Embiid, if I'm still trying to make that case, I would say, hey, he is second in the league in scoring, right behind LeBron James at 29.9 points per game. We talk about Jokic not having really a supporting cast, and yes, he has Harden now, but I think we got to remember with Joel Embiid how he was carrying the 76ers while Ben Simmons was on his extended vacation since the playoffs. The fact that Embiid was the driving force for that team while Simmons was not there, and obviously getting James Harden helped him, but we're still seeing that this is still a very Joel Embiid driven team. So his value, I don't think has really taken that much of a hit comparatively. When you think of Jokic to be a repeat MVP, what are you doing that's excelling your team? Do you talk about, you've mentioned a great point, Jamal Murray being out, Michael Porter Jr. has also missed parts of the season as well. He's probably not going to come back to the playoffs. Almost averaging a triple double. And this is where I kind of have to be a little bit consistent for all my dogging of Westbrook. The fact that I've started to get to the point where I look at the triple double staff and I I don't revere it as much as I used to. Now it just kind of seems like a run of the mill thing, especially when it came to Westbrook and you literally saw guys bailing out of the box to let Russ get that rebound. It kind of diminished that stat to me. And I I got to to the point where triple double, yeah, it's nice. That's cool. But is it really like the make or break between winning games? For Jokic, it is because he's also a very dynamic scorer. The fact that he's still averaging 26 points per game, I think is a big part of why his team is winning. And I don't think that that takes anything away from him. And then I look at Giannis here. So the two time MVP, third in scoring behind Embiid. So it's not like he's a bad scorer compared to the rest of the pack. In fact, he's third in scoring comparatively, which is a career high for him. And if it's a career high for a former MVP, and that means he's outpacing his MVP seasons, then that should say, well, isn't he more of an MVP this year? He's doing better than he was doing in his MVP seasons, right? He's shooting more free throws. He's shooting his free throws at a better percentage. He's uh, second in the NBA and plus minus. So all the stats are there for Giannis as well to be that guy. And they're all great defenders. These guys don't just ham it up on the offensive end and then just don't give a damn about their defense. No, they're all top five defenders. So this is a very close, very razor thin margin of MVP debate. And you can just nitpick it to death depending on what stats you like. So you are saying Giannis is your guy today. Uh, I would say Jokic is the person I would want to give the award to, but I'm it's, giving it's, you an MVP vote, Kyle. Can I split it between Jokic and Giannis? Can I split? You can give MVP me vote? a first, second, and third place MVP uh, vote. All right, so uh, we're gonna do this thing. So this is a this is a coring heads is going to be Jokic. 
Tails is going to be Giannis. Let's see what I get. Tails. So I guess Giannis number one, Jokic number two, and Embiid number three. You know, one of the things that is also interesting about this is I know that the the NBA MVP is supposed to be who is the best player in just the 2021-2022 season. But like unofficially, NBA fans have started to use the MVP as like a way to remember seasons. So like the 2017 season is like defined by the Russell Westbrook MVP or the 2019 season is defined as the Giannis MVP season, or they define it by the champion or whatever it is. So if we're going to use the MVP award as like the main thing that we use to tell NBA history, which I don't think is the right thing to do because someone who finished second in the MVP, like James Harden three times, is still a ridiculously great player. Yeah, but you know, 20 years from now, the only ones who are going to remember that is who you would call old heads. Do we want that to be the case? Is the thing. Do it we want if that we want to be that, the it's way going to be the case? Because no one remembers the AFC Championship game loser from 1979. Just uh, part of how I like, think it was the, the Raiders. Might have been the Raiders. Let me see. But even still, unless you're an absolute sports it. junkie, you know we still have to cater to more casual fans. Not everyone cares about sports as much as we do, unfortunately. It was apparently the Houston Oilers. Uh, the Houston Oilers apparently lost the AFC Championship to the. I knew the Pittsburgh Steelers won it, but I wasn't sure who lost it. It was the but, Houston Oilers. But for but, the people that don't know the blood type of the assistant head coach of the <laughs> 1982 Lakers, this is how we can measure or look at people's like history, you know, MVPs, titles, NBA, all teams, uh, which too, these guys are still going to get rewarded in some aspect on the all NBA teams or the all-star teams. That's part of their history as well. It's not like you lost out on the MVP, you get nothing, you go home, zero prizes, Charlie, go home, Charlie. You get <laughs> so nothing. If, that's good, if we're going to do it that way, and if we want to tell NBA history to casual fans through MVP awards and championships, which we already do now, like we already said, I have no rings, therefore he's a bum, which we do less of now, but that's obviously some of the way that this goes. If we want to cater that way to casual fans and tell NBA history through MVP and through like champions, then give it to Joel Embiid. Because if we're picturing out the most fair painting of NBA history from this era of basketball, how would you define the NBA from 2018 to 2022? If you're trying to make a map of NBA history, you would say, two MVPs for Giannis, one for Jokic, one for Embiid, one for James Harden. And that would be a great way to explain it is Giannis was slightly better than Jokic and Embiid, but Jokic and Embiid were the second and third best players of their generation. And so if that's the way we want to tell the story and we don't want to put Giannis and Embiid and Giannis and Jokic on the same platform of two MVPs, I understand doing that. It would be a more accurate picture of NBA history. It's just a uh, a philosophical question of sorts of whether or not we want to tell NBA history through just these first place MVPs. And there's multiple arguments you could look at an MVP discussion from. There's the pure baseline of statistics, and obviously we've given you the statistics here, and they're all very impressive for all three of these guys. But one that I think also needs to be inserted into this debate, and I know we're having this with John Morant and the fact that the Grizzlies are 18 and two in games without him this year. But what value do you provide to your team? How would your team perform if you were not there? And when I look at those records, so currently the 76ers and games Joel Embiid have missed are are five and eight, so a 385 winning percentage. In games in which Jokic has missed the season, the Nuggets are two and five with a 286 winning percentage. In games that Giannis has missed this season, the Milwaukee Bucks are six and five with a 545 winning percentage. So that stands out. If you're making a purely value-based argument, that kind of stands out that Giannis is the only one of these three games in which his team has played without him. They actually win at not a great clip, the six and five. That's not a thing to write home about, but that's going to get you into the playoffs. They have all-stars around them too, like uh, Chris Middleton, uh, Drew Holiday. If Giannis had to miss an extended period of time, the Milwaukee Bucks might might be one of these play-in style teams. When I look at Jokic, if the Nuggets didn't have him in addition to the other injuries that they already have on their roster, this is a lottery team. When I look at the 76ers with Ben Simmons' absence pre-Harden, even if they did have Harden, they might struggle to fight for a play-in game. And if Harden never happened, they would definitely be a lottery team without Joel Embiid based off that 385 winning clip. So if I 
infuse the value basis of this argument, then I'm probably leaning towards a guy like Jokic myself, because clearly his team is absolute garbage without him. There is no difference. So here's the interesting part about that. The where the where the logic is slightly flawed in that is that we're assuming that we're only taking Embiid, Giannis, and Jokic off the team when they're not playing games. There could be a mass substitution during one of those games in which like all three of the Bucks are sitting or all of the 76ers are sitting. So it's not the most accurate picture of value. But like you said, when you were just describing it, like we know the Nuggets would be dog shit without Nicole. Jokic. We know the 76ers would struggle without Joel Embiid. And we know that if Giannis was taken off the Bucks, the Bucks would be like the seven seed in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, and they have enough pieces to compete. They're not the Nuggets. They're not the 76ers in regards to their MVP. And we even kind of saw it a little bit when Giannis went down in the playoffs last year. Obviously, it was great for them that Giannis was able to instantly heal a little bit of Mr. Miyagi magic thrown on him. You mean average 38, 15, and 10 in the NBA Finals with a flamingo leg? Exactly. No doubt that if the Bucs don't have Giannis in that series... It's done. It's gone. Yeah. So, All of this debate ultimately becomes a philosophical question. Well, how do we want our MVP award to be? Because I know uh, Rachel Nichols on the jump for years was always articulating the NBA needs an offensive player of the year award. And you could argue that the scoring title kind of works like an offensive player of the year award. But I think like Bradley Beal might win the scoring title one time if you go back yeah. in history. So it's not and the most accurate. Even this year, I look at like LeBron James performance this year, and we all accept that LeBron is just stat padding at this point and Mm -hmm. I would almost hate to reward LeBron this year and no disrespect to LeBron I'm uh, unlike the majority of our generation of sports pundits that hate on LeBron LeBron is actually one of my most favorite players in the league so I kind of hated when he went to the Lakers as a Celtics fan because I want to see LeBron succeed but I also hate to see the Lakers succeed so this season has been bittersweet for me because I kind of hate the criticism in a way that LeBron has received but I kind of hate rewarding stat patty behavior in the same way that Russell Westbrook has lost a lot of cachet for me over the years that's the same way I kind of review a rewarding LeBron this year. And that's why instantly I can't have someone that's like 13 games under 500 on their team (laughs) in the MVP discussion. There's some people that are still trying to make LeBron for MVP debates. No, it's between these three guys because all three of these guys are in the playoffs. All three of these guys have impressive statistical resumes and all three of these guys are worthy members of NBA history. As you mentioned, they are some of the greatest of their generation. It's interesting to see the second tier guys like uh, Luca, like a Devin Booker, uh, like a Joe. Uh, because I've, I've heard people make the argument, well, shouldn't MVP also be best player, best team? And that's where Devin Booker, you look at him and you're like, why isn't he more on this? Uh, why isn't he more discussed? Because the Suns have just been running away with the number one seed from beginning to end. Chris Paul has missed games at times this season, and it's been strictly on Devin Booker. Why isn't Booker gaining a little bit more love? Actually, do you have an opinion on that one? I mean, I think Devin Booker is criminally underrated, but I'm also not going to put him as an MVP. Like, it's just... But why not? His team is extension of him. His team is one of the best teams in the league because he's on their team. Hence, he this is, is valuable. Is he most this valuable? Is the same phil- no, this is the same philosophical question that we had earlier, which is what do you want your MVP to be? Right. Like, so in the 80s and 90s, like when we had numbers, but we weren't paying attention to numbers. And by the way, not every game was on television. Right. So you couldn't watch every team every single night. You didn't have advanced analytics and you didn't have access to every single NBA game every single night. So in that world, people defaulted to best player on best team because that was just the information that they had was here are the standings. Who is the best team? We're going to give it to whoever was the best player on the best team. It's how Carl Malone ended up with two MVPs during the 1990s. But that's just the information that people had access to. And it was a way of telling NBA history was this team excelled in the regular season. Let's reward its best player with the MVP as long as that player wasn't Gary Payton. And so this was how they told the story then. And now we have access to data and analytics. And over the past 20 years, player efficiency rating, which again, 
It's the stat that most reflects the eye test. 17 of the last 20 MVPs were the top in player efficiency. And the only times that people didn't give it to the most efficient player was for narrative storytelling of NBA history. So I point out these three examples all the time. The three players in the last 20 years that didn't lead the league in efficiency rating, that one MVP, 2009 Kobe, because Kobe needed to have one MVP for people to like tell the story of NBA history in the 2000s. 2012, Derrick Rose. It was either 2011 or 2012. Whatever year Derrick Rose won MVP. LeBron was the most efficient player that year. And Westbrook in 2017, which I think Harden was the most efficient player that year. So uh, I think 2009 also was Chris Paul, by the way. So Chris Paul might have gotten robbed of an MVP by that one. Good question here. Do you think the NFL does the MVP debate better? I think in the NFL, it's easier to do it. I think in the NBA, we place so much value on the MVP in the NBA that all of a sudden the debate gets muddied because we want Jason Tatum to be acknowledged for how great of a season he is. And we want Devin Booker to be acknowledged for how great of a season he had. I guess why I say that is because you say that the NBA is a little bit more reliant on trying to sell their MVP from a storytelling, from a historical standpoint. And yet Drew Brees, as great as he was, never won an MVP in his career. Russell Wilson, as great as he is, has never received a vote. Uh, Whereas like these guys, because they're so phenomenal, because they're so great, if they were NBA players, would they have gotten more consideration for these awards? So I think both don't do it perfectly, but the NBA does it worse than the NFL. And it's not to say like the NBA is actively trying to do this. It's just how the story gets told in the NBA. We can't watch every single NBA game. And I I think there is obviously a issue in comparing them in which they are apples to oranges because obviously the MVP discussion in the NFL has been reduced to best quarterback. It's currently a quarterback. Which normally is the case, by the way. I I don't even think that's a bad thing, by the way. I don't think reducing it to quarterback. No, because we agree we can make the case, and it's a very good case that the quarterback is the most valuable position on a football field, whereas an NBA, and we're talking about positionless basketball being a more new age thinking, a guard could have as much impact in game as a center or a dynamic wing could have a good impact in a game. Now it's interesting that we're seeing two amazing centers in Jokic and Embiid, and we're seeing a power forward in Giannis who are leading the MVP discussions. And LeBron, obviously, as one of the most dynamic forwards, although you could consider him a pseudo point guard as well, um, obviously has led this. And we thought for a while that it was going to be small guards that were leading the MVP discussion. We thought Steph Curry broke the MVP discussion. And here we are in 2022, and we're talking about two centers at the top and Giannis who gets criticism. We were all so dumb. We were all so dumb. We were like, look at Steph Curry. He's going to change the NBA. When in reality, Kevin Durant was changing the NBA right in front of our eyes. And we were all too dumb to recognize it. Big guys because win. We wanted to, it's simple, it's stupid, but we, big guys we, are important yeah. in the NBA. We wanted to believe that six foot two average Joes could take over the NBA. I know six foot two is nothing to sneeze at, but six foot two by NBA standards, we wanted to believe hey, average you Joes you swipe right on Tinder. As a six two man myself on a good day, that we wanted to believe that six two people could take over the league, but what happens when the 6'11 people start shooting three-pointers, huh? What happens when the seven-foot people can put the ball on the floor? I've seen Joel Embiid do a spin move and a windmill dunk. What yeah. happens Then you got when big Jokic, guards like Luka. I was going to say, Jokic, yeah, we talked about this four years ago, and it's even more true today watching the Nuggets this year, which I haven't done a lot of. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I haven't watched a lot of Nuggets this year, but I've watched a lot of Nuggets in the past. Nikola Jokic is a point center. He is the first point center in the history of the NBA. The same way Bill talked about like Magic as the first point forward, which became Scottie Pippen as a point forward and LeBron's a point forward. Jokic is a true point center. He is the first of his kind point center in the NBA where he is seven feet tall, plays a traditional big man role and takes the ball up the floor because the entire offense runs through him. But he can make passes as good as point guards from a seven-foot center position, bringing the ball up the floor, and the entire offense runs through Jokic. That was what Daryl Morey calls a super-skilled five. And the NBA began moving to super-skilled fives as soon as the four best players in the sport all became super-skilled fives. People realized that that is the next trend, is Kevin Durant is totally unguardable because he is seven-foot-one and can shoot over everyone 
Allen at the levels of the best shooters of all time. And LeBron James does everything Michael Jordan can do, and he's 70 pounds heavier than Michael Jordan. Can and we all so just that agree, the- though, that Kristaps Porzingis is the real trailblazer here? Uh, so close. <laughs> Kristaps was so close, man. Like, the, the world is not ready to have the conversation of if Anthony Davis was healthy, he'd be as good as Tim Duncan. But Anthony Davis kind of weirdly paved the way for all of this stuff. In a weird way, Anthony Davis in Kentucky in 2012 paved the way for a lot of this stuff. If ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. It's so strange, man. It's so strange. Anthony Davis should be in this MVP race every single year. He should be a super skilled five because he can play point guard and jump 15 feet in the air. It's it's crazy. I guess I have to make a definitive pick. You know what? I'm going to go with you. I, I think Giannis, I think what it is for me as I start to review the stats more is again, if he was an MVP and we all agreed he was an MVP a couple years ago, and now he's putting up better numbers than he was in his MVP season how is it that I cannot give that guy when I know his impact on winning I saw yes I'm tying in last year yes I'm probably Mm -hmm. doing a dumb thing from an NBA argument but I'm tying in last year I know he can win a championship I know he can elevate a team over the top and now I know what his stats mean I know they're not meaningless empty calorie stats I know all of his stats impact winning and that's why I gotta go with Giannis as my MVP and now starts the final quarter. Buckle up. Buckle up. This is the Slump Buster Podcast. There's nothing like a good rivalry in sports. Bears, Packers, Yankees, Red Sox, Duke, North Carolina. For the first time in NCAA tournament history, these two will square off. And no, it isn't a run-of-the-mill round of 64 game. No, it is the final four, no less. These teams have already played twice this season, splitting the season series. Joining us to talk this historic game and Final Four as a whole, not one, but two fantastic guests. Here to represent the UNC side, I got Blake Cochran of Keeping It Hill on the fan side and network. Blake, scale of 1 to 10, what's your anxiety level heading into Saturday? Somewhere around 400. (laughs) Well, we'll see if our other guest feels that same way. Playing Blue Devil's Advocate and to talk all things Duke, Ryan Loman, Follow Ryan at the Duke Nation. Ryan, how are you feeling one way or another? Coach K will coach his last game this week. Uh, I, I'm at about the same level as Blake. It's it, the, the nerves are there. It's it's sad. It's emotional. It, it's it's all the above, man. It's crazy. I can't believe this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question for both of you in one sentence or less. Tell me, what does the Duke UNC rivalry mean to you? For me, it's history. It's it goes back decades but as of as of late it's been like relevancy right like anybody who who knows uh or has been around the rivalry the majority of the last couple decades both of these teams have been relevant and and power teams in the country so I think for me it's it's relevancy at this point yeah I I think that this rivalry epitomizes greatness in a sport and you, you know you can't talk about one without the other you try to separate them it doesn't make sense like these two programs are linked historically and linked forever and a lot of that is due to the greatness of both programs and whether you're a fan of one side or the other you can't deny the greatness of the other so I may be a big Carolina fan but Duke is a fantastic program and I guarantee Ryan would say the opposite as well it's, it's just greatness. Ryan like I mentioned it's Coach K's last week coaching the Duke Blue Devils can you talk about what Coach K means to this program and his legacy in basketball as a whole. Yeah, I think I think for Coach K, his impact on basketball is it, it goes beyond just just Duke. It goes to obviously USA basketball, but Coach K is Duke. Like there was really, I mean, they had some decent teams before he showed up more than forty two years ago. But um, he is Duke basketball. You think of. Uh, Coach K, you think of Duke, you think of Duke, you think of Coach K. So to think that like, no matter what happens, this is the final week we get to talk about Coach K being the head coach. It's crazy, man. Like, and then I I just, it's hard to put into words, like what this week feels like the last few weeks have obviously there's been a possibility of it being his last week, but I I also kind of like this because it's all right. Now there's time to prepare. Like we know Saturday, it possibly could happen, but for sure by Monday uh, or Tuesday, uh, the the gig is up and it's John Shire's team immediately after uh, the final game of the season. So Blake on the flip side for Carolina, Roy Williams retired, I think it was in the middle of April last year. So they already had the roster for next year. The transfer portal had gone through. And in his first year, Hubert Davis is taking them to a final four. He's going to start bringing in his own recruits in the next couple of years. So what do you make of what's gone down in the first year for North Carolina as a building block for the program, moving off of a massively successful coach in Roy Williams, who, you know, retires 
pretty much on the spot. And, you know, Hubert Davis takes over and goes to the final four. I mean, obviously you can't be upset as a Carolina fan in the totality of the season. I mean, they are in the final four. There's absolutely no Carolina fan that's going to say, okay, this wasn't a successful season. Now, how did they get to that point? Obviously there were some concerns early on and even halfway, even three quarters of the way through the season, people wondering, is this the guy? Um, They've lost every big game they've played in. They've been absolutely destroyed in a handful of them. There were some growing pains and there were a number of fans that questioned whether or not Hubert would be around for a while. Now, that's still in question. I mean, he could completely fall on his face next year. Uh, I don't look for that to happen, but it has been an up and down roller coaster ride of a season. And anybody who is filling that big of shoes, I mean, wait for it. Like Ryan, right off the bat next year, you already know if John Shire struggles, people are going to be upset. And like, it doesn't matter whose shoes you're trying to fill. If they're as good as a Coach K, a Roy Williams, a Dean Smith, any of these people. Like, I I fear for the next person at Kansas that tries to come in there after Bill Self. They're terribly hard on the coach, but ultimately, it's been a fantastic season. This team has galvanized and come together incredibly well. They've played great basketball the past three to four weeks, and and they're in the Final Four because of it. I do do want to feed off that real quick, and this is more of a question for Blake, but if I remember right, Hubert also wasn't the, like, the fan, not fan favorite, but he wasn't, like, an all-consensus pick. Like, everybody was on the Hubert Davis bandwagon when he was hired, correct? That's Absolutely, absolutely. And there were a million names out there. And some of them weren't even logical. Like people wanted Mark Few. Okay, like Mark Few's got a great gig. Okay, and like him and Roy Williams are like really good buddies. Yeah. And the chance that you're going to get him to come from Spokane, where he's got a program that wins 30 games every single year, competes for a national title every single year. He's literally, he has the key to that state. Like the fact that he, like he wasn't going to come, right? And then they started throwing around like Billy Donovan, throwing around all these other names that just didn't really make sense. The thing that mattered most, obviously, in the hiring was that Roy Williams handpicked this man. Mm-hmm. Um, the fans didn't necessarily agree but nobody really cared what the fans thought and to this point did they struggle to get to where they got to yes but their tournament run has been rather impressive they blew out Marquette they did blow a big lead against Baylor but still beat a number one seed uh you know they topped UCLA they beat the Cinderella that was beating everybody in its path and uh yeah so the fans weren't certain Uh, I would say they're much more certain and comfortable now uh, so these teams, like I mentioned earlier, they, they split the season series. UNC got the most recent victory. What about that last game do you think can translate, Blake, to this upcoming matchup? The most important thing to me is the expectations. The pressure, and, and people will argue this, the pressure is all on Duke again. The pressure wasn't on North Carolina in that first matchup, and here's why. You've got 100 alumni in the stands that are watching the game. Every single one of them expects a win. You've got uh, 9,000 fans. Every single one of them expects a win. Not one of those fans think that they're leaving that that arena that night as a, the losing team. Not, not one of them. The Tar Heels came in and they played loose. They shot well. They got to the free throw a bunch of times. Uh, they, they marginally won the rebounding battle. Like They looked really, really good. They looked like a team that was playing loose. Similarly, no one expected North Carolina to be in the Final Four. Not one single person okay people were saying they were going to get out in the first round there's no way they get past Baylor Duke was supposed to be here Kansas was supposed to be here a lot of people picked Villanova to be here North Carolina I I don't like to say that a team's playing with house money because obviously they're this far like you want to win but the pressure is not on North Carolina in this game Ryan on the other side Yeah, like I I agree to the point you made, but I also think that after last game, I I don't think there's as much, there's definitely not as much pressure on Duke. And I think you can make an argument that there's a little bit of pressure that that favors North Carolina after you went into Cameron, you spoiled Coach K's last game. But I said it uh, after that game happened on our show that if we go in and win the national title, that's wiped out. That's that's fine. That's all as well. And especially now, if you beat North Carolina in the final four, that's all wiped out. So I think on on the North Carolina side, there there was some, some social media trash talking. Obviously, these guys, all know each other they're no strangers to to one another especially on social media so um I, I think there's some talk that needs to be backed up and that's kind of what I'm hoping for from the Duke side as a motivational factor and like you said Blake there's not the alumni there's not there's really not even the camera and the medias that were around all week like I was told that Duke hardly practiced that week um there was media involvement and in everything they were doing so the pressure is definitely less which is weird because this game is like you could argue is bigger than that game, especially in terms of this season. So uh, I think the pressure is even, but I would probably give a little bit more pressure to the North Carolina side to back up that performance in Cameron. To get to this point, uh, what have you seen so far in this tournament, this road to the final four for Duke that gives you confidence in this game? 
Yeah, I think it's the the consistency on the defensive side. This team uh, against North Carolina, against Virginia Tech, even against against Syracuse in the ACC tournament, they didn't look great. They couldn't defend the three ball. A big reason why North Carolina won that game is because R.J. Davis and Caleb Love could shoot the ball. It was known coming into this tournament that we couldn't defend the three. Now, I will say we haven't played any teams that shoot the three all that well outside of maybe Michigan State, but the defensive side has definitely uh, been locked up a little bit more than it was the last few weeks of the season. Uh, and then you're just getting more consistent, more dominant play from Mark Williams in the post uh, and also Paulo Bancaro um, has has played a lot better now than he did to end the season. So what I'm holding on to is that this team shows up at the biggest moments, which they did at the beginning of the season against Gonzaga and Kentucky. Um, and now they're doing it uh, in the NCAA tournament. So that, that's what I'm hoping for. And then Blake on the North Carolina side, it's, you mentioned the games earlier, rather the Baylor game where Manic gets ejected and UCLA where Love kind of has a big game and another game it's Baycott. And they've kind of had an interesting run so far. So how has the, uh, the, the Cinderella type of feel for North Carolina have been a, a different type of vibe for North Carolina going deep in the tournament. Yeah, well, you know, in recent history, other than the 2000 Final Four appearance where they got to the Final Four as an eight seed, typically if North Carolina is this far in the tournament, they're expected to be. You look at years like 2008, 2009, 2000, you know, 12 when they fell just shy with the Kendall Marshall injury, even in 2016 with Marcus Page and Bryce Johnson, 2017 when they won the title, all these years you know, they were expected to be in the final four. And most of those years when they get a top seed, that's pretty much where they end up. Um, usually when they have a little bit of an off season, you know, they don't make it this far. Um, the thing that I've liked most about the tournament run is their ability to face adversity and actually play well in the face of it, because that's what they struggled through most of the season. You know, they got punched in the mouth early uh, against, you know, Tennessee, Kentucky, even the first Duke game and didn't really show a whole lot of fight after that. You just kind of saw a team that was just this fledgling thing that, you know, was down, you know, 10 or 12 points, nothing insurmountable, but then it just snowballed. You know, over the course of the last two weeks, we've seen them just steamroll Marquette, get into a situation where, you know, I'll leave out the officiating factor in, in the Baylor game where the Baylor does catch all the way up. It goes into overtime. And based on everything you've seen the whole season, you're thinking, wow, I, can they even win this? Immediately overtime starts. You get a three-pointer out of Dontre Styles. They play lockdown defense and they keep scoring and they and they walk away with the win. UCLA, a close game. You know, they they faced adversity and they've been beating it, you know, the last couple of weeks. And that's the thing I'm most optimistic about. You come out here, you play Duke tough to start the game. In the second half, as long as it's close, anything can happen in this rivalry. <laughs> it's easy to get lost in this game. This is obviously the marquee game of the weekend. Uh, no disrespect to Kansas Villanova, but regardless of who gets this victory, they still got one more game to play. So Blake, I got to ask you coming out of that other side of the bracket, who are you most worried about? Who do you think is going to come out of that side of the bracket? Uh, what type of matchup advantages or disadvantages will North Carolina have in that matchup? I think this matchup is for the national championship. I think the team that comes out of this game wins it all. And I say that because I think that both teams are going to match up well with the winner who I expect will be Kansas because Villanova is down an important player, which is, is really bad for them. I, I, you know, if it wasn't for 2016, I might feel bad for him, but I really, I truly think that the way now, of course, if, if one of these teams come out and just lays us, you know, an egg, then that totally changes. But the way that these teams are playing, uh, you know, to Ryan's point about the defensive end for Duke and the way that North Carolina has been playing offensively, we're talking about a team that couldn't hit the ocean with a stone for two years from three point range is now one of the best three point shooting teams in the nation. Twice this season against Duke, they've hit nine threes. And that was a big part of that second win was the nine threes and, and their accuracy from the free throw line. They were 19 of 22 in that second game against Duke. That was a big part of winning that game. Uh, these teams are really firing on all cylinders right now. Duke had a little bit of a scary game against Michigan State, but right when it got close, they did what they needed to do, got over the hump, they won it. I really think that the national champion comes out of this game. Ryan, what do you think about the uh, Kansas Villanova matchup? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Justin Moore being out is is just tough for them, man. I have nothing against Villanova, so that sucked. I was kind of hoping that they'd be able to get past Kansas because I'm just anti Kansas as the blue blood conversations for a different time. But I think Kansas is a, is a fellow blue blood in this final four. I, I didn't want to see them in the title game, but yeah, I ultimately think it comes down to Kansas. The one thing I am worried about is I know Blake, you said that you think the national championship comes from this game, but I think the not the letdown, but like all that's going to be surrounding this, and then you have one day to prepare and one day to refocus and be like, we got to go win one more basketball game against a really good Kansas, probably Kansas team. That, that's tough to do. And I, I think both teams have the talent to do it. It's just a matter of the mental focus and, and fortitude to turn around and be like, all right, we got one more. The job's not done because as great of a victory as it could be on a Saturday for one of these programs, it could be just as big of a letdown on Monday if you don't show up. Hollywood can wrote a better ending. All right, guys, Ryan Loman, Lake Cochran, 
Thank you guys for joining us so much. Blake, you want to start off with some obligatory plugs where we can find some more of your content? Yeah, at Keeping It Heal uh, on Twitter and, and keepingitheal.com, we are releasing countless articles day after day after day. Everything from um, obviously tournament coverage and, and live game, you know, tweeting and, and articles to uh, recruiting. Uh, the transfer portal right now is incredibly busy, so we're covering all of that as well. Ryan, same to you. Yeah, I'm at the Duke Nation on Twitter, and then uh, I do I host a show with myself and Duke NBA on Twitter, and we call that Crazy Twitter Live. We'll be live at least after the game on Saturday, and then maybe once before. So check us out. Um, it's a lot of fun to, to interact with the fans and, and get people's thoughts after the game. You learned with us. You laughed with, you us. Laughed with us. Now it's time to do some deep thinking. Hashtag Bust the Slump with your weekly words of wisdom. As part of my uh, late night treadmill session, I was listening to some motivational stuff recently, and there, there was one phrase that kind of like stood out to me. Are you watering the weeds or watering the flowers? Not actual gardening. Are you watering the things that matter to you in your life, allowing those things to bloom, the flowers, or are you allowing just weeds to grow in your garden? Are you allowing the bad thoughts? Are you allowing the things that bring you down, the things that aren't helping you to become better, that aren't helping your garden stand out amongst the crowd? And I, I think, you know, this is a good place to think about. It. It's just like analyze your life from time to time. Take a mental inventory of the things that really matter to you and the things that you want to see continue to develop, skills you want to see develop, the relationships you want to see continue to develop and help those things continue to bloom. But take out the things, the toxic relationships, the toxic information, the bad thoughts that I can never make it, that I'm not going to do this. I, I, this is not going to help me. Those are the weeds. Those are the weeds. And the best thing to do there in that situation, just pick them, get those negative thoughts out of there. Let the flowers bloom. Kyle, do you have to do any weed picking yourself? Uh, probably. It's always coming up in your life, right? The the world is always trying to harm you. And that's unfortunate. But we just got to keep being open and transparent and doing what our gut tells us to. Listen to your gut because your gut is pretty smart. And your gut knows what's weeds be easy to see. We just try and convince ourselves that things are not weeds for whatever our reasons might be. Perfect timing because April showers do bring May flowers. Guys, I need you to hit that subscribe button for more words of wisdom. I need you to hit like if you're watching this on YouTube. I need you to leave a five-star review. Help our positive thoughts. Help our garden bloom here. Uh, check out at Slump Buster Podcast on IG, at Slump Buster Pod on Twitter, at Slump Buster Pod on TikTok. Stay safe, happy, and healthy. And we will see you next time.